Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the life and work of the contemporary artist Francis Bacon, who died in 1992. His paintings are among the most expensive ever sold. My guest today is my good friend James Tunney, an artist himself, a poet, a novelist, as well as a barrister who has lectured all over the world on international law. He is author of The Mystical Accord, Sutras to Suit Our Times, Lines for Spiritual Evolution, The Mystery of the Trapped Light, Mystical Thoughts in the Dark Age of Scientism, Empire of Scientism, The Dispiriting Conspiracy and Inevitable Tyranny of Scientocracy, tech bondage, slavery of the human spirit, as well as two dystopian novels, Blue Lies September and Ireland, I Don't Recognize Who She Is. His latest book is called Human Entrance to Transhumanism, Machine Merger and the End of Humanity. James lives in Gothenburg, Sweden, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, James. It's a real pleasure once again to be with you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And uh, I was glad to, I don't know if I congratulated you on your recent 100,000 viewers. So congratulations for your hard work. You deserve 10 times that at least. Thank you. So we'll be talking about Francis Bacon, the artist today. And I think considering that our last interview was about William Blake, who was also an artist and a great mystic, Francis Bacon, the artist, is a very different figure. Yeah, he is a very different figure. But I, I would like to suggest that he, he may fit into an archetypal, an archetype of the magician that is underestimated and doesn't really appear uh, in the literature. They're, they're missing some element of Francis Bacon. Often he himself talked about mystery, but the, the exact analysis of what he means by mystery is ignored. So there are some more similarities than people might think, although he's, he's not, he's, he, I wouldn't say he was a mystic, certainly. And he didn't particularly like William Blake very much, although he he did uh, do famously did a, a picture of his life mask. Um, they are they do share some similarities in relation to the value of the imagination. Both of them were committed to the significance of the imagination. And if we want to chart out the imaginarium, the mundus imaginalis, or the imaginal world. Bacon would come into the reckoning as well. So he's, he's a serious figure. And I, I think that thinking of him in terms of a magical approach uh, may actually get to some of the mystery of him. Now, I have to confess that until you began talking about Francis Bacon and some of our earlier conversations regarding the role of art in uh, consciousness, I it wasn't familiar with him in spite of the fact that uh, at least one of his paintings has sold for over a hundred million dollars. He was a, a new name to me. And so I suspect many of our viewers won't be familiar with him either. Um, yes. It, and maybe more so uh, that a lot of people may be even repulsed by his art. They find it quite difficult. They find it horrific. There's a certain element of gothic horror about it. They don't find it uh, something pleasant. You wouldn't necessarily have bacon pictures on all around your wall at home for some people. And in that sense, he may be a bit inaccessible. And then some people are critical of his lifestyle. Is they see his connections or his disposition perhaps to the underworld, and they don't particularly like the figure himself. I have to confess, 
I like the figure. I like his art. And I have been very impressed the more I looked at him over the years that he has very important things to say. And even though there are fantastic um, there are fantastic biographies, and there's a very big one recently called Revelations, which has got a lot of attention, is very thorough and comprehensive, I, I, I still feel there's bits that are unexplored and elements that are underemphasized. But certainly he, he's a major figure. He's an artist that influences other artists. You can He, he has had a big influence on filmmakers, from uh, Bertolucci to David Lynch, Christopher Nolan. In fact, they would have borrowed ideas from Bacon and in ideas of the Joker and Batman have been influenced by Bacon pictures. Uh, Last Tango in Paris starts off with Bacon, Bacon pictures, for example. So he is very influential for other artists, uh, but he is very popular and, and his ex- exhibitions do very, very well. Um, so he may be an acquired taste, but he is certainly one of the most significant artists of the 20th century. So, but, but, but I would emphasize him also as a significant intellectual figure. I guess he's most known for creating uh, images of the human face that are, to, to put it in one word, grotesque. Yes and no. There's, there's different phases in his, in, in his career. He's influenced uh, in certain ways at certain times. So uh, when he started off, he was influenced more by people like Legere and, and his, he, he was regarded as constructivist in some senses. Uh, and then he evolves. He's influenced by Picasso uh, at, a, at a particular stage. And there's a, uh, just to show you a picture of, of the influence that people would point to, you can see a self-portrait by Bacon and a picture by Picasso. And you can see similarities. I wouldn't overstress them, but he was influenced at different stages by different artists. And he, there is a grotesque, if you like, tradition going back to Germanic painting and going back to vivid representations in Central Europe of the human figure, which reflected the reality of life, that terrible things happen to the human body, that it expresses the vulnerability of the human body. And the grotesque element is usually associated with his representation of the Greek myths. And in particular, he was influenced by the Oristia, uh, which is the work of uh, Aes- Aeschylus, uh, the great uh, Greek tragedian and he was influenced he, he had access to greek tutors uh, or people who were informed on, on the greek myths when he was young and he was also very much influenced by a book by an irish professor called stanford who wrote a book about uh, aeschylus and how significant aeschylus was uh, and that all that view was also reinforced by his love of nietzsche so that led to a particular view so in his great work uh, three studies for figures at the base of the crucifixion in 1944 he's referring to the grotesque figures are representations of the furies and the furies to him represents an element of the psychic constituents of human nature so they're representing his nature but they're representing every man and every woman's nature so what he's saying in these grotesque figures is this is what it's like these are the emotions that people have. So we always hear about Jung and how to look at your dark side, but the dark side is always someone else's dark side. And it's always turned into something which is kind of nice and it's something which is interesting or edgy. But Bacon is saying that these deep emotions that, that drove Europe to two wars that he witnessed and that at the stage when he made that breakthrough, uh, the information about the, the concentration camps was becoming clearer. Uh, so he's saying that there is an atavistic force in human nature that hasn't been addressed. So he's representing, he's holding a mirror up to us. In, in, in other senses, his figures, he does engage in an element of, of distortion, but that distortion is because he believed that you had to take the appearance and go behind the appearance and present the appearance back to someone so that they got a greater sense of reality than the appearance itself. So this is also consistent with what scientists say about not the world we see is not what we perceive. And he's saying that when we're dealing with people, there's a whole range of psychic forces that exist 
that are there that are not represented in a, in a purely banal image of a photographic image. He was very influenced by, by photographs and used photographs. But in all the cases, he's looking for something be, behind it. So the, what he's saying is this grotesqueness is something which is in us and we have to deal with it. And in that sense, also, he's accused of being violent. His pictures are violent. And he couldn't, he, 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 he challenged this and said, well, how can my pictures be violent? They're only images. So there's, there's an element in the human brain that doesn't want to look at things it perceives as violent, blood and all these things. But it's very, very happy to inflict death on people in foreign countries, you know, with a push of a button. If it's clean, if it's nice machines, if the scientists say it's OK, if there's distance. So distance can make people do awful things. And Bacon was saying, look at the reality, the bestial atavistic nature of, of, of ourselves uh, in order to understand the world. When we initially began our conversations about Francis Bacon, you suggested that this could be viewed as a study of somebody who is engaging in the left-hand path. Yes, I think there's, there's um, he, he could be. And, and I, I'm increasingly drawn to the idea, as I said, that he, he's engaged in something which is akin to magic. Uh, now, I'm not saying he's a ceremonial magician, although there is there is one of his friends who did say that when he was going to his studio, that it was like there was an amulet on the door in his in his mind, and he was going to a different space, and he was convinced that Bacon was engaged in some kind of esoteric practice, not necessarily in secret societies, but in his own esoteric practice. And he certainly had a lot of of contacts. What what I was interested in him is is how can we distinguish or what lessons are learned by his approach as opposed to other people who are engaged in similar things but go a different direction? We might contrast them, for example, with a figure that he, that he met and, and he shared some characteristics with, which is Christopher Isherwood, who engages in, the same, in some of the same journeys that Bacon did. And he goes to Berlin as well, as Bacon did, which was which is important, and wrote, wrote Goodbye Berlin, and that that became Cabaret, and uh, and all those those great that great prose. Isherwood goes and he follows the the Hindu path, the Vedanta path. So he definitely goes the a difficult path when he goes to California in particular. Now Bacon is engaged in similar things, but he never gets in, engaged in. Um, directly in a spiritual evolution that may be seen to be mystical directly, although he does cross into it at various stages. He does, in my view, have a psychic element. He has a precognitive element. For example, there's a famous picture he did of, of Henrietta Moray's, and in the picture, he, used to, he got someone, John Deacon, to take a photograph or a number of photographs of her, which he subsequently sold nude photographs in the pubs around Soho, which he wasn't very happy about. But Bacon gets the photographs. And uh, in, in, when she's lying on the bed uh, in the picture, he puts a syringe in her arm. He said it was a visual, a visual thing for him to pin the figure down. But at that stage, she wasn't taking any drugs. And it was years after that she became addicted to heroin. So in some sense, there's a kind of psychic an anticipation, which, which is there. And also... I've said before, if you look at uh, many of his pictures, it it's kind of anticipates the UFC and this idea of figures fighting in a caged in, in environment. There is a, a kind of psychic uh, element about it because he was very open, because he said uh, in relation to his technique that he was a medium for chance. His idea was that he had to open himself up. He had to create a kind of compost for his consciousness by accessing a whole range of different sources and then out of that by chance like a roulette wheel he was a gambler as well that he would he would come to uh, an ideal image the ideal image would impress itself on his nervous system and he would put it into a a picture which would operate on someone else's on the viewer's nervous system he, the nervous system was a critical thing for him so in that way he was like a receptor and in many senses, his description of a painting is in terms of concentration. He was making a concentration of reality. So his picture is not a depiction of reality. He hated illustration. Uh, he hated decoration. But he was making a concentration of reality. Now, the nearest analogy we have to that process is but the idea of a sigil. 
uh, a sigil that magicians use to concentrate an image. And when I began to think about that, I, I, I wondered whether he had any connection with the other, well, with a forgotten London painter, fairly forgotten, Austin Osman Spare, who is a magician and who wrote about sigils. And he doesn't come up as having a connection with Bacon in any of the books that I've seen. But Austin Osman Spare was a painter magician who exhibited in the Lefebvre Gallery. And 15 years after him, Bacon exhibited in the Lefebvre Gallery. So it's not that far apart. And another, another interesting painting, painter magician, of course, is Alistair Crowley. So Alistair Crowley also went to Berlin and had an exhibition there in 1930. Now, um, Francis Bacon had been there from 1927. It was a big eye-opening experience for him. But they're in the same kind of milieu, and Crowley is trying to be a painter. So this image between painter, magician, is a very established image, and we've come, we've come across it before. Um, but Bacon is heavily influenced by Nietzsche, and he, has kind of put a, he puts a cap to a, a certain extent on his willingness to engage in the right-hand path. He's, he's certainly not interested in the established religions. He said he was brought up uh, as a, as a, or strictly as a Protestant, which meant he believed in nothing. That's his, his word. He, he didn't believe that there was anything, um, that they were teaching something. He believed it was part of the imperial structure that he was born into in the Anglo Irish class. Uh, he's born in Dublin, of course, and he's brought up in the grand houses in County Kildare. His parents are from England. But this, the Anglo Irish class are, are, are very, very interesting, of course, very, very significant in the evolution of the Gothic tradition, which in some senses, he may be a pro related to. I'm going back to uh, Oscar Wilde, Bram Stoker, uh, Ch uh, Charles Maturin, all those figures. There is some uh, influence there. But it, he, he, the dis accurate description of his path, I think, is Dionysian. He, referring back to the birth of tragedy and Nietzsche and referring back to his love of uh, Aeschylus, he believes that Dionysus, Dionysus, or Bacchus. Bacchus, of course, in the, in the Roman form. Bacchus and Bacon sound very, very uh, similar. And this is the inspiration, the God who, who is interested in intoxication, in ecstasy, in wine, in vino veritas. Uh, Bacon loved wine. He loved, in a famous interview uh, on, on the South Bank show, he he's out drinking, asking questions of the interview and getting, getting the interviewer drunk because he, he he used it as a way to come into the deeper sense from which his particular technique would emerge. So that Dionysian element is very, very important. And one last point about that is that he was very influenced by Aeschylus. And Aeschylus was actually born in the place where the Eleusinian mysteries happens in Eleusis. So this mystery element is there right from the start. And there is a, a possibility, in my view, that his reference to the, the, the figure in the chair constantly, to the, uh, the, the popes, the serial of papal uh, ideas, the, the man in the chair, the patriarch, the hierophant, it may be a reference to some of the, the, the mystery traditions which he would have read about because he's a great reader. And the, the wheel, for example, is, is a, a symbol associated with the Greek mysteries. We see these figures and these motifs appearing. And because he read so much, I, I'm convinced that he was, he was more familiar with the mystery traditions and because of his interest uh, in, in, the Greek, in Greek tragedy than other, other people uh, have suggested. You also have pointed out to me that he was probably influenced by Sir Francis Bacon uh, because they shared the same name. Well, it's, it's very interesting because he does refer a few times to the idea that his father uh, was very interested in Bacon. His father believed they were descended from Bacon, and that seems to be true from a collateral descendant. Um, of course, there's a lot of issues about who Francis, Sir Francis Bacon was, and there's arguments that he's the illegitimate child of Elizabeth I. Uh, in that case, he wouldn't. Francis Bacon wouldn't be directly related if that was the case. And there's also the great arguments, of course, that he was William Shakespeare, or he wrote Shakespeare's works. And this has been quite ignored by by the biographers, I think, because it gives us a, a possible key to understanding uh, Francis Bacon, the painter. 
being brought up with this great figure uh, who his father revered. Now, Bacon didn't like his own father, who was a major, who was interested in the traditional things that the British imperialists were interested in, which was breeding, uh, wealth, horses, dogs. And Bacon had no interest in that. He was asthmatic. Uh, he just wasn't interested in that. And he was regarded as effeminate by his father, not tough enough because of his asthmatic conditions and that. And uh, the the effeminacy was more important, perhaps, than, than his his gayness or being gay because uh, one point that people forget is that a lot of people in the upper class in, in Britain uh, reg- accepted it that they were bisexual. It was normal. They believed that when they went to boarding schools, for example, if you read about the boarding schools, that relations between the boys were kind of normal, something they did that wasn't regarded as anything different until they, they got married, for example. There was a, there was a lot of it about so uh, and that that hypocrisy of of course was something that Bacon never liked. He didn't like this hypocrisy, and it's interesting as well where that comes from because it comes in legislation in eighteen sixty, the early eighteen sixties, uh, when science is on the rise. Because people forget that there were views, a kind of homophobic scientific views that knocked around for a few generations in the early part, and there's a sense that the British Empire regarded homosexuality as being a weakening factor for the administrators who was sending abroad. And in fact, in, in one study of, of uh, legislation uh, which criminalized homosexuality, about 50% of the entire world's uh, regulation came under the auspices of the British Empire, and some of them remain today or up to very, very recently. Now, Bacon didn't like this. Uh, Bacon didn't like this hypocrisy but he he was also aware that there are allegations or suggestions that sir francis bacon also uh, was attracted to men as he was so there was a number of connections but francis bacon is very sir francis bacon is very important in a number of senses he is seen to be you know the great scientific uh, promoter of inductive reasoning uh, and sometimes I, I, I myself put him into too narrow a category, but he was also interested very much in magic. Now, scientists have written this out of the equation. They've forgotten about his, conveniently forgotten about his interest in magic. They've forgotten about the fact that he suggested that we should engage in studies of telepathy. He, he, he has written that. Uh, and they have ignored this process. And Bacon... If he wanted, he would have heard about the connection with Francis Bacon. His father didn't have books, but he may have had books about uh, Sir Francis Bacon. And also, when he's getting in, interested in Greek and the Greek mysteries, there's another possibility of connection with Francis Bacon. And throughout his life, he talked to people. He talked to everybody. He talked to the the, the highest and the lowest. And he would have heard this Francis Bacon idea very, very much. And I think... He used it. And also, Sir Francis Bacon said, there is a picture of him by Hilliard, and I think the inscription says something about painting the mind, if you could only paint the mind. So perhaps that that is a bit of an inspiration for Bacon, that painting the mind is a very, very serious issue. His great friend, he had two great friends, uh, artist friends in London, Lucian Freud and, and, and Frank Auerbach, both born in Berlin, uh, Jewish, that came to, to, to London. Uh, and remember, Lucian Freud is the grandson of Sigmund Freud. So the idea that painting was something marginal was not in their mind. They were coming from a great intellectual background, and they believed painting was important, and painting the figure was very, very important. So uh, the, the, there's a, a lot of issues coming to him, but I believe that the connection with Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon, is very, very important. And also, Sir Francis Bacon made an interesting statement long before the Romantics and Edmund Burke talked about the sublime in 1757. He said that in all great beauty, there is an element of strangeness in proportion. So he, he believed, Francis Bacon believed, that beautiful things had something strange in them. So we could actually find the sources of some of Francis Bacon, the painter's idea, in Sir Francis Bacon's writings. 
Well, it strikes me if we think of him as following what is in esoteric circles described as the left-hand path, that one of the characteristics of that path is a critique of the hypocrisy of the so-called right-hand path. In that context, I have to declare myself a bit more left-hand path tendency because in a lot of his critiques, I have a lot of respect for, uh, for Francis Bacon, the painter. Um, he was in the context where he was watching, for example, uh, the persecution of gay people and homosexuals, and in a context where he was witnessing a huge practice of it by people in powerful positions. So that hypocrisy certainly didn't appeal to him. He saw people practicing about or preaching about religion and Christianity, and they were dropping bombs on each other and they're killing each other. And th then they were uh, they were doing unspeakable things to, to, to races of people, uh, to, to groups of people. Uh, he saw what would, what happened in, in Nazi Germany. So and he had been there before it happened. He knew what it had been beforehand. So uh, in many senses, he's right. The hypocrisy of uh, of the empire, of the militariz uh, militarism, and also I think of science because in his paintings, sometimes he's described as a, an expressionist, sometimes surrealist, but he was a realist in his view. Uh, he was depicting the deeper reality. And in that sense, he was suspicious of the idea that we're reasonable, rational creatures. And he has good reason to be suspicious because he's looking at the world around him. He'd seen the Zeppelins flying over London in, in uh, World War I and dropping, dropping bombs. Uh, he had worked in the air raid patrol in World War II, helping driving the vans, taking people out on the Red Cross. So he'd seen what the consequence of these great, the great military industrial complex uh, was. And certainly the churches he'd seen were heavily invested in it. They were merely an addendum to the military, industrial, imperial uh, uh, context. So in that sense, I, 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 I'm very sympathetic towards his critique, and he was very honest and very, very brutal about it. He was very caustic in many senses. He, at the same time, he was very convivial, but he was very caustic when, when he wanted to be. And that caustic nature is evidenced uh, in, in his paintings. But yes, that, that's very accurate. He, he shows the benefit of the critique uh, and the hypocrisy, and the, the, particularly of the British Empire. Um, and in that context, he saw what was happening to in Africa. He saw the destruction of the elephants, for example. He was friends with Peter Beard, who, who, who would, had work, or took a lot of photographs over there. Uh, and well, he, he, he fancied him, if you like, but... but Peter Beard was heterosexual, but they had a, a great friendship, and he and he painted them. But uh, the 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 sheer hypocrisy and Kant was something that he couldn't understand, and he, the Nietzschean explanation was very close to him. But he had read early on. If you look at some of his early readings, he had he had read about the Faustian nature, uh, Spengler, and the Faustian nature of Western society. So I think he had accepted that as a given. It was true, and in, in that sense, his approach. Uh, address that and his uh, sometimes they talk about him using a cloak using his Irishness as a cloak for example to protect him in English society in certain contexts or uh, disappearing all the time he behaves like some kind of uh, unusual figure uh, that that uh, is magical he, he had to adapt to a situation where he was an outlaw as a gay man at the, at the, at the time so People talk about him mixing with criminals, but he was he would have been engaged in criminal activity. And people talk about his underworld connections. Uh, well, there's two elements to that. Uh, he was put in that underworld by that hypocrisy. And secondly, him going into the underworld, I think, was a deeper issue. It was going back to the Greek mysteries. Going into the underworld is a classic element of the Greek mysteries. And he was engaging in a deliberate and literal engagement uh, on the fringes of that as part of his psychic development. But to answer your question, yes, it does actually show that the, 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 the horrific hypocrisy um, that he opposed. And I think today he would be still, 
hugely critical and he would see that those empires didn't go away. They have just coalesced, unfortunately, in the new empire of scientism, as I, I would say. Do you think it's also relevant to understand Francis Bacon as an artist to to look more deeply at his personal life, which, uh, as far as I can tell, was marred by various tragedies and uh, also a, a penchant, I gather, for sadomasochism? More masochism than sadomasochism. He, as one of his friends said, he was a born masochist. Now, this is an, an interesting element because... He liked to get beaten up by uh, by rough people and particularly proletarian uh, rough. Uh, but he was introduced when his father sent him off to Berlin with a, a cousin of, of the family who he believed might help him uh, develop and probably cure his his predisposition as, or condition as he saw it. Uh, he the figure that that he he. He ends up having a, he has a relationship with him. He said he was the most sadistic figure he ever came across. But sadism is an inherent part of empire. It's 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 embedded in all these schools and in, in, in the public school system. It's embedded through initiation, through hierarchy, through physical and sexual abuse. It's rampant. It was rampant in the empire. And not only that, they whipped everything. Everyone was whipping everything out in the imperial classes. Uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, they're still whipping the horses, of course, uh, but they uh, whipped people. He was whipped when he was young. He, he makes some exaggerated stories sometimes. You don't know what's true. Uh, but he said he was whipped by the stable boys, various arguments about him being abused by the stable boys. But he seems, in other senses... He seemed to be a willing participant in it, but he sought out uh, masochism or masochistic con context. I, I would just point out that William Gladstone used to go out uh, to try and convert the prostitutes in, in London. That was his kind of hobby and to talk them out of, uh, of their career. And then he would go home and flagellate himself. This was very, very common. The whipping yourself, whipping your, your family members. It was really, in that class, it was really not uncommon. Uh, at school, of course, they, were, they, they encountered these systems. And in my, when I was a boy, I mean, they used the, the Christian brothers were sh show their Christianity by, by, you know, by hitting you on, on the hand with the leather straps and all that. But the this corporal punishment bit was embedded in the culture. So he was coming from Edwardian culture, was uh, it wasn't strange, so I wouldn't pathologize that. Although he did, I mean, he he did have some serious injury uh, in that, but he never made much of it. Uh, and, and to a certain extent, that was his choice. But it's funny, although he's a masochist, he's still accused of being the violent one, which is it's quite the next step from pacifism. He's still accused of being the violent one. His argument was, well, that he was. He was not engaging in in in, in violence or, or in, in, on other people. He was engaging in consensual uh, in consensual activities under the law. Still, you can still be prosecuted uh, even with consensual sexual sadomasochistic tendencies if it goes over, over certain uh, boundaries. But I would point out to another figure from the Anglo-Irish context, which is Gerald Herd. Now, people forget about his Anglo-Irish background, but he also wrote a book on pain, sex, and time. And this was about the future evolution of human consciousness. And he argued that there had to be a transmutation of the vitality of the pain sense and the sexual sense in order to evolve to the next level. So this idea of the connection between pain and altered states is not an unusual one. And in fact, if you look at uh, many traditions, Pain and altered states is very, very close. Native peoples all around the world, we, we, we can see that. And even in contemporary societies, in, even in a Christian mystical tradition. So there is an argument that he was utilizing, um, whether people like it or not, he was utilizing pain to achieve altered states of consciousness. Now, I'm not recommending that to anybody, but, <laughs> but there is that, that evidence uh, or that, that possibility and that sense of, there is some psychological things I've come across which suggest that there is an element of 
of dis disabling the, the 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 ego, the mind in some of these practices, which facilitates people escaping from the boundaries of a straight jacketed personality. Now, again, uh, I'm, I'm not advocating that, but I think there are explanations there. So, uh, in that sense. He, he did in, in, engage in intoxication. He did engage uh, to change his state in ex seeking ecstatic states. Uh, and in some senses, this, this predilection in that context may be interpreted as part of that. A lot of people won't see that. But presumably, intelligent people who are intellectual, well-read, know what they're doing in, 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 in certain contexts. And they make choices. And they make choices consistent with with, their, with their, their own life and he perhaps may have utilized that of course there is there is great tragedy in his life uh, Peter Lacey one of the men that he, he loved most uh, died when he was having having a, a, an exhibition a great exhibition to Tate and of course the greater tragedy was when his his lover who he had the relationship was on the rocks or, or nearly over but he was still with him in Paris uh, George Dyer, who committed suicide on the weekend that his great exhibition by the French state at the Grand Palais in 1971 was opening. So that is a great tragedy. You may see it as, as a, a kind of uh, connected with his sense of destiny. A lot of people would criticize him for that. Uh, but um, uh, there's only so much we do. We can't attribute uh, other people's choices necessarily to him. And also, other people have di psychological difficulties, and and again, coming from a very difficult situation at the time for for gay people, and and in that context, I, I I think we have to be careful about how we if we sit in in a, a position to morally judge others in, in that context, and every one of us uh, have has tragedy in our own lives, so we can uh, when you've lived. When you live a long life like him, he's, he's going to encounter that. It's the nature of existence for him. He was also, uh, from what you have told me, regarded as a very generous person who went out of his way to help other people. Well, he, he, was, he was regarded as very convivial, as very charming, who had a great aura in many uh, senses, who was a great conversationist, although some of the one of the books I read recently said he learned his conversational skills in France, which I thought was a bit ridiculous for someone coming from Ireland. But uh, the he was regarded as very convivial, very generous with his money. Uh, there's stories about... I, I, I did meet... I have met, as I said before, Frank Auerbach, the great artist. I met him, bumped into him three times. I, I didn't actually talk to him about... When I talked to him, I didn't talk to him about Francis Bacon. I, I didn't think it was it was appropriate. I was asking about other artists at the time, but Auerbach did get money off him when he was poor, as most artists w was. Um, he was very generous. Marianne Faithful said that she was homeless and living in Saint Anne's Square, I think, in Soho, and Francis Bacon went by and he recognised her, and. Uh, although she was homeless and obviously a bit unkempt, he would take her off, and she was also suffering from, from anorexia, he would take her to the fancy restaurants that he went to and uh, feed her and have great discussions about art, and he did that any time he saw her in, in that context. And she said he never judged her, he never asked her about anything, so he just treated her as, as a, a human being with generosity. And it's it, it's it's a feature... And again, he's not pontificating about that. Francis Bacon is not telling anyone else about that, which is often a feature because sometimes the people that talk about being good and being nice and helping everyone, everyone else turn out not to be like that in, in, in real world situations. And there are many examples of his, 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 his conviviality and uh, his attractiveness uh, to other people to, to weigh in the balance uh, uh, of, of all these uh, things. And he had a certain a certain disdain for money as people in that class did uh, and he had certain disdain for rules which again we can maybe understand it in a left hand path context when he regarded a lot of them as hypocritical he would certainly break the rules he would have robbed people uh, when he was younger man and not taught too much about it in certain contexts even his his lovers he, he was caught robbing money out of their pockets uh, but but that was kind of 
that was a reflection of the fact that in some senses uh, he wasn't as engaged in, in in that process he was genuinely interested in some higher order things but uh, yes certainly it has to be put in the balance that uh, he 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 was very helpful and, and in contexts where it wasn't recognized for example he had the same nanny for 40 or 50 years that came to him with him nanny lightfoot she comes to london with him and she helps apparently she couldn't see or was, was blind at a certain stage but she helps organize his gambling den uh, his illegal gambling den in his studio you know so she's she was uh, an interesting character but after she died I, I think he went to visit an old lady that was a friend of hers so he would do those things that he didn't have to do and that uh, gives evidence of a, a figure with humanity and with compassion uh, and also he had although he was caustic and and, and could be very bitter um he he did have that sense of manners and conviviality which and certain some of that would have come from his background and come from ireland as well because in the past in particular it's changing now but hospitality was a very very important thing in the irish context and you couldn't really function without a commitment to hospitality and he had some element of that uh, so uh, he deserves it, it deserves to be put in the balance of, of a full life. One of the most amazing facts that I have learned about Francis Bacon is that his estate has now preserved his art studio, not only preserved it, but I gather they moved the whole studio from London to Dublin and it is now set up, I, I suppose, as a museum open to visitors. Yeah, it's it's in the Hugh Lane Gallery in in London, and I suppose it, w- it was donated by his estate. Uh, and I suppose, to a certain extent, um, it was a bit of divine justice because a lot of the a lot of the collection uh, in the National Museum in Trafalgar Square was actually owned by the Dublin Gallery, and they never actually returned it. There was a legal case uh, about that, but the estate donated it, so you can see his studio. It's very. It's an eerie uh, thing, but it's a very interesting addition to the Hugh, Hugh Lane Gallery, and of course, it's it's bringing it back to uh, where where he he came from. So there is a bit of a a return in, in that sense, and it's very very interesting. So it is a bit ghostly, and and one important point in this for parapsychology, bearing in mind the central trust of of, of your your life is parapsychology. Um, there's a lot of seems to be a lot of parapsychologists who are looking for work and, and and not not find finance and and not getting enough uh, jobs and having to work for the military industrial complex themselves and 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 actually the connection with art is one of the most neglected areas. I know that in Lund there, there has been uh, papers by, by by our friend uh, Cardoso in in relation to. Uh, art and parapsychology, but the connection is really, really deep. His break, the breakthrough painting of of uh, Francis Bacon was his studies for the crucifixion, f- or for a crucifixion, not their crucifixion, which is, is important. There's not even a traditional crucifixion in the painting. It's studies for a crucifixion, which I think people have to be careful with. I see journalists making mistakes about that as well. Now, this was his breakthrough painting, so it was inspired by his the book by Stanford about Aeschylus, uh, it was also about a time when people were again beginning to know about what was happening in Germany uh, a bit more. But in the painting, I just want to refer. I, I, I this this is one of the elements. This is one of this the the triptych, one of the pictures. And this form was taken directly from a book on parapsychology, the phenomenon of materialization, in 1920. You can, you can see it there. So Bacon is very, very interested in spiritualism, in parapsychology. And this is his breakthrough painting. So parapsychology was a critical factor in his breakthrough. And it, that's ignored. So those huge, huge valuable paintings were informed very much by his reading of the study of, for example, the phenomenon of materialization. And that's ignored. And other figures, I'll just show you one more, which I think this figure, uh, now you could see it as, as a man going into a shower, for example, like that. But this curtain feature is an, a very important element of his pictures. Now, I believe that that was more informed by his understanding of the spiritualist, the spiritualist cabinets 
and is access to pictures of in the spiritualist context so that there was a direct influence he was very influenced because here we have an example of people saying that what you're seeing is something different there is some force outside the body and he 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 believes that he's representing the emotion and he turns to parapsychology and it gives him a direct a direct result and often what appear to be shadows in his work is a representation of a type of ectoplasm he was informed by this so what i can't figure out is why parapsychologists don't celebrate the connection between one of the greatest artists of the 20th century and what they have been doing and begin to engage in a discussion of these issues so uh, there there are some people uh, i have seen a paper looking at um bacon and neoplatonism and, and there is actually which uh, a talk which is coming up which will be in a few days time after we have recorded this about uh, bacon and the occult by the college of psychic studies in london so it's clear that more people are beginning to look at these connections because there's definitely a connection he's, he's interested in egyptian art and he he knew egyptologists and of course egypt is very very important in a lot of the the esoteric societies in london so that connection is there he did a famous painting with a sphinx one of the uh, interesting figures he was interested in he's, he's also interested in yates uh, who's another uh, ma magician as well but he, he he's very much engaged in the literature or key literature associated with exudations of the teleplastic element and there's another strange but interesting connection with parapsychology he may have been interested or linked to or, or, or come across uh, Baron Notzing, who did the phenomenon of materialization because of the interest or his interest in sexual deviance. And this is interesting because at the time they, they said that homosexuals were sex, sexual deviants and they were trying to engage. But there was also a strong argument that parapsychologists were deviants. And that was from other psychologists. They were saying that this, this belief that there is some other thing out there, these spirits and all that, is a deviance, a kind of mental problem. And that, that movement happened in response to, to not seeing that. So this is, a, this is an important uh, connection which is ignored. So I would say that uh, people should really, uh, in a parapsychological context, they should look back at the direct evidence which is established, in, in, in my view, of his appropriation, use, reference uh, of parapsychological literature and ask, why was he doing that? He was doing it because he was interested. He had friends that were interested in spiritualism. He was interested in the literature. Apparently, he's a second cousin of Dion Fortune, whose, whose maiden name is Firth, and his mother was Firth. So there's another connection. He would have come across these figures, as well as known about the, the, the artist magicians. Remember, Yeats started off as a painter as well before he becomes a poet and magician. And also, Bacon tried to be a poet, but wasn't successful. There's not much made of that. But in his explorations, he would have, and, and he was very familiar with poetry. He was very into T.S. Eliot. But one figure, just last point on this, one figure which is ignored in this is Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And he, in many senses, is a kind of predictor of the counterculture in California years after drugs and uh, experimentation with the, the occult and, and that. But people forget that Coleridge was very important in relation to describing the, imagina the imagination. And he had two ideas of the imagination. There was first, we had the primary imagination, which is the, which I would call consciousness itself. And the secondary imagination was the use of that imagination to achieve things, to achieve things artistically. So the artist had secondary imagination, was a developed sense of the primary imagination. And he regarded this as magic. Samuel Taylor Coleridge regarded the secondary imagination as magic. Now, I believe that Bacon may have been familiar with that writing, and there's another curious connection. Bacon lived in Kensington, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge lived uh, in, in Kensington. So he would, have, he would have known that, and he was interested in poetry. And there's another odd connection which might be relevant, is that 
Samuel Taylor Coleridge died in Highgate in London, in North London, near where we talked about before, where the, the River Fleet rises. And another person that died there was Sir Francis Bacon. They died in, in, in very close proximity at different times. Sir Francis Bacon supposedly was doing his experiment with freezing a chicken or uh, led to his death. But they both died in the same in the same area. And I think Bacon would have, uh, have liked that connection. And Sir, Sir, Sir Samuel Taylor Coleridge tried to explain that Sir Francis Bacon wasn't actually as narrow as people said. And he tried to indicate that Sir Francis Bacon was engaged in a much broader description. But by, and the last point, uh, promised the last point, Samuel Taylor Coleridge is also the person who brought into his poetry the language of magic, of incantations and spells. He was the poet who brought it in. And consistent with the idea that poetry is magic, we find another connection which may inform the idea that Bacon was driven by a kind of left-hand path idea of the magical function of, of art, which is a an archetype that's insufficiently kind of uh, categorized because they they identified a ceremonial magician, they identified a natural magician, they identified a divine light magician. But this figure, who is a, a, a magician artist archetype, is there, and it's even there in the literature. You mentioned that he died because he was engaged in an experiment involving freezing of chickens. Sir Francis Bacon, yes, yeah. I didn't know anything about that. Yeah, he he was uh, he was uh, I think in his coach at Highgate, and uh, it was it was snowing, and he was beginning to think about using the snow to stop the bodies decomposing, as far as I remember. And in that sense, well, the story was ut utilized as uh, in in his martyrology for science, but uh, really. He was far more than uh, a, a, a scientist, although he's very important in that experimental tradition because he was very informed by Paracelsus and the uh, great magicians and going back to the great Renaissance magicians as well. But Francis Bacon, the painter, knew that. he would. He's familiar with Highgate. He knew about Coleridge as well because of his interest in poetry. But Coleridge never never surfaces in these discussions and i find it a bit strange even if he even if he never looked at coleridge which I, I i find hard to believe even if he didn't know about what coleridge had written about francis bacon even if he didn't talk to anybody uh, in, in his multiple conversations he would have known about that and bacon talked to a lot of great other artists for example in in tangier uh, he, he used where his lover was he he was very familiar with William Burroughs and with Allen Ginsberg. And Allen Ginsberg said, I think he was, he described Bacon as having a demeanor like an Irish schoolboy, but the uh, behavior of a satyr, you know, that idea of the satyr, again, the Dionysian element. So um, Bacon was very, very familiar with artistic ideas. He wouldn't have ignored figures like this, particularly figures that were understood the the value of altered states of consciousness. And I, I think that connection is a, is a possible one. Even if it, if it didn't happen, the explanation of the magician or the magic of the secondary imagination, the magic of the artist is clear. And think about it. Here is a man that could go out, like Francis Bacon, go out and be out all night in the Colony Club in Soho, drinking with whatever his own the world, a whole range of people going home, getting up in the morning, going into a studio in the chaos and the mess, as you can see from any of the pictures that is still there in Dublin. And from that, using a process of unconscious scanning to pick out particular images, opening self up as a medium uh, that chance operates on his nervous system. So he projects an image onto the picture and then he has created something. It's a magical act. He's created something that's worth hundreds as time tell hundreds of millions of pounds it's an object he has created from an image this is classical magical activity uh, so the there is a there is a proximity there which has been ignored and it's probably ignored because this habit we have of putting people into different boxes of putting specialists into increasing specializations they're failing to look at the interlinking areas and this is what bacon was good at 
he was looking at the whole range and then he would see a trend across, a lateral trend across a whole range. And we're, we're, we're focused so narrow that we fail to see those interconnections. It would seem to me that uh, perhaps the real magic of what he was doing is forcing practically uh, large segments of society to pay attention to the, the brutality and the hypocrisy of modern life. Exactly. That, that's exactly right. Because there's a few strange paradoxes. For example, the, as people note, the slaughterhouse and religious ritual are very, very close. That, that connection is, is a close connection. When Christians go or Catholics go and they're getting the body and blood of Jesus Christ and in the doctrine of transubstantiation, it's believed to be real uh, by people. Jung has written about that, about what's involved and the magic thing. But I mean, there is a very, very close connection. But we don't want to acknowledge those elements. We don't want to acknowledge the consequence of this great weaponry that all the great scientists are using their, you know, the, the, their skills to produce. They create a distance between what they're producing by focusing on elements of it, by compartmentalizing and not looking at the end product. So they, uh, again, and it can be blessed by the church and it can bless the missiles and that. There's, there's a great hypocrisy. So he has a mirror in his studio and it's a bit darkened and it, it reminds me of the uh, Corinthians and about through a glass darkly and that uh, I think it's the esputron is the, is the Greek word which referred to the dark glass. Now the dark glass in that context is probably the same as John Dee's showing stone that some of these great mystics and great prophets were using magical techniques to look in like the psychomantium to look into the, the unconscious to find uh, what's there. Blake looks into a dark mirror and the distortions are what he sees in society. Remember that at the time he was becoming popular, he was going against the grain because he was he brought the human figure. He brought himself. He brought his his, his friends, no matter how distorted. And he was focusing on the human figure, as was uh, Frank Auerbach and Lucian Freud. So everyone else was going abstract. And that movement towards abstraction is a is an element of. Uh, contemporary and modern art which has been ignored. Why is that happening? Why did that happen? That the human figure began to disappear from the artist, from the painter's uh, canvas. It's an interesting story that hasn't been told in my view. But Bacon was emphasizing the human in all their problems, in all their, in all their animalistic nature. But he was emphasizing as well the bloody hypocrisy of the world that the, the, of the slaughterhouse, of the of warfare, of empire, and he was saying you can't look away from that. And he he was drawing on them because they were powerful, because there is a powerful uh, unconscious and conscious charge associated with these things. But in modern society, we want everything to be clean, we want everything to be distant, we want everything to be organized, we want everything to be unorganic, mechanical, and he's emphasizing. And in, in that sense, his conviviality is a great defense of the human figure, despite the arguments about distortion. His mirror is showing that the human figure is actually being distorted. The human figure is being distorted by deep emotions, by failure to deal with that, and by the world, and the, the world that they're forced into. All his figures sitting in a kind of claustrophobic room, screaming in a chair. Well, it kind of it's not that far from from what we've experienced in recent years, people being forced to, to be at home. He, he's indicating that this, the process of evolution of these imperial structures are not consistent with people living, with people expo exploring their nature, including the divine nature, although he doesn't go into that. He did, have, he did have a, which sounds like a mystical experience that he wouldn't talk about, uh, a, a couple of years after his, his George Dyer died, uh, religious experience and he wouldn't talk about it. And, and the reason why he wouldn't talk about it perhaps is that people forget how materialistic the upper class the, the the powerful class in britain and the imperial class were that they had become they'd become so engaged in a machine and an organization and the scientific revolution particularly with huxley and that had taken the spirit out of conversation it was taboo so B Bacon may have inherited a bit of that. He may have been more spiritual than we think. 
And when he's talking to people about existence and the end of existence and there's nothing afterwards, sometimes he's challenging the other person. We don't know what uh, some of the views we might take with a pinch of salt. I, I think he was a deeper, more spiritual person than people understand. I think he was even more complex th th than uh, we're, we're led to believe. And he certainly had some psychic elements. He certainly was interested in domains that you're interested in, in, in uh, giving your, your, your life towards in, in relation to parapsychology. Uh, so uh, we should look at that and other people should look at that and they shouldn't come with, with prejudice. And if he is utilizing the power of Aeschylus, because Aeschylus discovers that tragedy is inherent in human nature and in that there's all kinds of rationality as well, but they're often bloody rationality that the rationalists and the people that emphasize reason fail to indicate how they deal with things that are irrational and, uh, and are emotional. And you did a talk with Peter Dawkins, I think, on uh, Sir Francis Bacon. And the thing that come out, came out of that conversation for me was his emphasis on motion in relation to Francis Bacon, on the idea of motion. And that was a key element in relation to Francis Bacon, the painter. His, he used photographs, but in particular, he used the book, The Human Figure in Motion by Mybridge. And a lot of that was an important part of his idea. And the word motion is inherently related to the word emotion. And that was an important part because he believed that when he was using his paintings, the concentration would open the valves of, of feeling open the valves of emotion. So he was opening his so that he could open the other person. And he believed that by doing so, he was doing something beneficial. It was getting the person to respond and that you had to engage in that. You had to engage in that pressure cooker environment in order to encounter uh, the what the human person is. So he's a, a defender of the human in my view. And he's not the, he's not a person that's violently assaulting the human. It's the system that's that's doing that. He's he's illustrating some of the consequences of it. But his he surrounded himself with people. He was very very sociable. Uh, he came out. He painted people. Uh, he was interested in other people all his life. So it, it, it's it's a bit funny that he is criticised by people who probably don't like people as much for 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 being in some way violently. Uh, anti-people and unsympathetic which I don't think he is so I would defend him in that context and and he is an inspiration uh, like other artists like their lives you take the whole lot the whole thing and he was open and uh, everyone can 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 uh, not everyone is as open as he so therefore their lives may look all nice and lace curtains and quiet and not frightening the horses but uh, that element the darker element is something that he embraced and utilized and channeled and used in a kind of cathartic way uh, for himself and used to produce art, which obviously has some purchasing power, some power, some potency, which derives from that, that still survives, that makes people very interested and that makes other artists inspired by him. And uh, I think that's why he, he, he will continue to be a significant artist when some of the more abstract artists perhaps may not survive the test of time. Well, James Tunney, once again, you have opened my eyes. I have to say, uh, Francis Bacon is a person I had never really heard of until I met you. And now you have filled me with a deep appreciation for his life and for his work. So I'm very grateful to have had this conversation with you and to have been able to share it with the New Thinking Aloud audience. So once again, James, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you very much, Jeff. I enjoy that. And we will, I'm sure we'll take up some of the issues about in the future about the nature of will and, and which is very, very important, magic, etc. There's great issues. And as always, I appreciate your input and the opportunity for dialogue. So thank you very much. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Thank you.